Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 will be starting with verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Answer thou nothing? What is it, the witness, uh, what is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. The high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure ye by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter, ye, did you see how he went from the first person singular, talking to the high priest, and he jumped to first person plural. Now he's talking to the entire Sanhedrin. Shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face. They buffeted him. And the others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. When he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, That, that were there, these uh, said to him and those that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him, they stood by and said to Peter, Ah, oh, surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. We'll pause there, and let's take a moment of prayer. I give each believer an opportunity to prepare your heart for the study of God's word by confessing all known sin before the Father. Truly, listen to me. If you don't do this, you've wasted the hour. If your heart is not ready to receive from the Lord with a clean heart by confession, then the rest of the time is wasted. So this is the most important time of our study together, that you might confess your sin before the Father and then ask that he might teach you. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, we come before you with a sense of awe because your word is eternal, forever settled in heaven. You are the author of our faith. 
You are the one who sustains us, who guides us moment by moment. And you're the one who teaches us now. As we open your word, we pray that your spirit might speak to each and every one of us according to the need of our hour. You know it's coming up in this, in this next week. And so I pray that you might prepare each of these men for what you have in store for them. Train them, teach them. Train me, teach me. For we come before you in humbleness and thanksgiving. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've come as far as the passion of the king. Um, If you notice, we started that um, last week in chapter 26, verse 1. And then this will go on through the remainder of chapter 27. And we're looking at the hearings. And I really would, I don't know how I'm going to, but I really would like to get through all of the hearings that are leastwise um, mentioned in um, Matthew. Um, I put before you, there was actually six hearings. There were six trials. But you go to John, John chapter 18, and you see his trial before Annas. And then you see the trial in, uh, in front of Caiaphas, which I um, have before you. And then the Sanhedrin, also before you. And then Pilate. And we learn from the um, Luke's gospel that Pilate um, began to try Jesus and then realized, whoa, Galilean, that's out of my territory. I should give it to Herod. Did he have to? No, this is Jerusalem. He can do whatever he wants. He's in Judea. But Jesus was from Galilee. And so he deferred to Herod. Herod takes that as a great honor because he didn't have to do that. He deferred to his authority. And then Herod turns him back to Pilate's authority, making Pilate very pleased that Both of them felt like the other guy recognized his power um, in in this situation. And so they were bosom buddies the rest of their life. And here they were, um, cat and and mouse or two cats at each other. Um, They didn't like each other until this particular afternoon when they became friends over this. So... We're going to look at the trial before the religious authorities. There's trial before the religious authorities. Three trials, if you notice. And then there were trials before the civil authorities. Again, three trials um, before them. Let's look at the trial before the religious authority in verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off to the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. According to the law, the high priest was to serve until his death. He was appointed as high priest by the religious authorities And he served until he died. But when the Romans took over Judea and that piece of property, they asserted their right to appoint the high priest. And they would um, look for a man that would accept Roman policy. And so, um, Annas... Um, the high priest from uh, A.D. 6 to A.D. 15. Was appointed by um, the Caesar as the high priest. But then in A.D. 15... He ceased that role, and it went to a, by, a guy by the name of Ismael um, Ben Fabi, who you don't know anything about. He's not in the Bible, but he is in the historical records and such. And then later on, 
um, uh, the son-in-law of Annas, Caiaphas, became high priest, was appointed as high priest by the uh, the new Caesar at that particular point. And, you know, it's just kind of interesting when you stop and consider these guys that even though Caiaphas at this point in time is now high priest, he still turns to his father-in-law as any smart young man would do and looked for him to lead. Okay? So, the first one actually that sees Jesus is Anas. And then he goes from there to Caiaphas. Um, so after he, Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he was led by the temple guard to Anas first. I remind you, those of you that were not here last week, this is the temple guard. Do not go with the television and the movie producers and believe that this is Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers never answer to Jewish people who live in the province that they're guarding. They would never have been in that position. So it was actually temple guard, and there actually was a military guard that took care of the temple grounds. Why? Because if the Romans moved troops in there, there would be civil war. So the, they needed a military presence, but it needed to be a, of Jews that were answerable to Rome, uh, would accept Rome's sovereignty, and that's what we're having here. So the temple guard takes Jesus to Annas first. Then this delay tactic apparently gave Caiaphas time to wake up. This is the middle of the night to wake up and assemble the Sanhedrin. Then Jesus was taken to Caiaphas. Both Annas and Caiaphas were Sadducees, which means they did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. As Sadducees, they did not believe in spirits. Therefore, they did not accept the concept of angels or demons as anything but mythology. They did not accept the idea of an afterlife. They did not believe in any part of the Old Testament except the five books of Moses. Caiaphas had already made it clear that he intended to make sure that Jesus would die in order to save the nation. John chapter 11, verse 47. He said, one man has to die for the nation. And then, of course, John jumps in and says, that was prophecy, because he did die for the nation of Israel. Verse 57, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants. Peter follows the Lord. Remember, he said, even if the rest of the disciples leave you, I'm going to follow you. Remember? Yes. And then what did he do? He ran. He ran, but he went a distance. And then he watched that mob with the temple guard moving across towards Annas' palace. And he began to move. And then he knew from there they're going to go to Caiaphas's. So he went to Caiaphas's palace and blend in as best he could with the uh, servants of Caiaphas. He followed the Lord uh, at a distance, uh, at a safe distance. Verse uh, 59, we read, Now the chief priests and the elders and all the councils sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, Yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The purpose of Jesus' trials was to find some legal basis on which to condemn him to death. Judas' testimony was crucial to the religious leaders in this case. 
But Judas was nowhere to be found. He didn't know where he was. As a result, witnesses were sought uh, against Jesus, which is highly unusual court procedure to actually go out and look for guys. The Bible actually said they looked for false guys. They weren't looking for any truth. They were just looking for who would take a payment and be able to say something uh, to bring life a uh, sentence of death against him. Many people were awakened in the night, happily volunteered to be false witnesses against Jesus, but none of them could agree on anything that could be charged against Jesus. Oh yeah, a lot of different things happened, but they couldn't find two to agree. And as you know, Hebrew law, they require two witnesses. Finally, one story given by two witnesses agreed with each other. And that was that, whoa, a few years back, Jesus had said, I have the power to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Did Jesus say that? No. no. John lets us know that Jesus did not say that. What he really said was over in John chapter 2 and verse 19. If you've got a limber Bible, look at John chapter 2 and verse 19. And this was near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John chapter 2, starting with verse 19. We read, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy. The verb is third person plural. So a good southern translation would say, Y'all destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Um, he says, You destroy. These witnesses came and said, Jesus said he was going to flatten the, t the temple and in three days build, rebuild the temple. Is that a crime? If a man said, I will tear down this building and in three days I'll rebuild this entire building like it is right now, would that be a crime? No, we might deal with the guy as if, you know, something isn't all tightened down. But crime, well, it was the closest they had. It's interesting that this statement should be recalled soon before his crucifixion and resurrection, when it was going to be fulfilled, what Jesus said was going to be fulfilled. You know, Craig, I, it ain't even a crime to say, I'm going to kill you unless you do it. Right? Well, so, yeah. yeah. Um, Jesus remained silent to the charges that were brought against him because he was never officially charged with any crime. Saying that you could tear down a building and rebuild it in three days is not a criminal offense punishable by death. So verse 62, we read, And the high priest rose and said unto him, Answereth thou nothing? Don't you say anything to this? What is it which... Th these witnesses again this witness against thee but Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Messiah the son of God Jesus saith unto him thou saith that's what you have said he says nevertheless I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Verse 65. And the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you've heard his blasphemy. The high priest attempted to get Jesus to respond to this lame accusation brought against him. Still, Jesus remained silent 
and that was his right in court. Then the high priest charged Jesus under an oath by the living God that he answer truthfully. Was he the Christ? Was he the Messiah? The Son of the living God? And Jesus answered, You've said it. Adding that in the future they would see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Almighty and he would return to this planet earth on clouds of heaven. Well, there was the clear statement that they were looking for. He is claiming deity, clearly understood by the high priest who immediately tears his clothing, which he was forbidden to do by the law. Leviticus 21, verse 10, directly commands the high priest never even upon hearing that his mother has died, he is not allowed to tear his clothing. At no matter what news, that Jerusalem's walls have fallen. He is not, for no reason, says Leviticus 21, verse 10. But he tore his clothes. Listen to me. In so doing, the Levitical priesthood was ended at that very moment. No more witnesses are required. Jesus, Messiah, is condemned. Caiaphas declared that Jesus had spoken blasphemy. He must die, according to Leviticus 24, 15 and 16. Leviticus 24, 15 and 16, a person who speaks blasphemy should be stoned to death right at that moment. And they could have stoned him. I think sometimes when, you, when we read through the Gospels and we see these very crafty Jewish leaders saying, oh, we can't do anything. You have to as the Roman leader. You're the one that has to condemn him to death. All they're trying to do is shove that blame over onto the Roman. Why? Because there's people up in Galilee that thinks this guy is the Messiah. And if we stone him to death right now, we would be in trouble with it. There could be insurrection in our own country. No, make it done by the Romans. Could they have stoned him? Do you remember a guy by the name of Stephen? And what did they do? They didn't look for any Romans to get them out of that one. So understand, they could have stoned him to death. Ah. But that would have gone contrary to all prophecy. For was the Messiah going to be stoned to death? No. Pierced is what the prophecies had said. So, they desired, the, the Jewish leaders desired to be above accusation because there's so many out-of-towners in town right now, we could get in lots of trouble. Give it to the Romans. Verse 66. What think ye? This is the high priest saying. And they answered and said, He is guilty of... Blasphemy. blasphemy. He is guilty of blasphemy. Stone him to death. He's not guilty of death. Okay? These guys... It's early in the morning. Don't fault them too badly. This is in the middle, you know. It's still. Ah, they've been up all night. It's dark. No, it's absolutely forbidden. You must have the trials in the daylight, but they are violating um, the scriptures. <laughs> then did they spit in his face? They buffeted him, and others smote him with the palm of their hands. Um, no further evidence was examined at this point. No one defended Jesus or spoke of the miracles of God that he had performed among them in the past three years. No defense counsel. Got it? He had healed the sick. He had cleansed leper. He had caused the lame to walk. He had caused the blind to see. He had raised 
on a few occasions people who were dead. He fed the multitudes twice. He had just put, he had just, in a matter of minutes, put the ear back on Malchus. Who is Malchus? The servant of the high priest who's bringing this cause of blasphemy against him. He had seen Malchus. How'd you get the blood on your shirt? <laughs> Malchus had lost his ear and he got it put back on by this man. No one speaks to his defense. <laughs> All of this was public knowledge. It wasn't done in a closet. These miracles were witnessed probably by many of those people standing there present. But no one stood up in Jesus' defense. He had just spoken words of blasphemy, which they all heard. Contrary to both Jewish and Roman law, they took it on themselves to begin to punish the accused. They spit on him in the face. They struck him with their fists. They slapped him. They spit. <clears throat> Don't you love it when I give you the Greek word? Come on. You're going to like this one. M is upon. Tuo is the Greek, proper Greek word for spitting. Taking saliva and spitting. Actually, this word comes into our language. Just make that into a Y and look it up in your dictionary and you'll see that we actually use, utilize that Greek word. They spit. They spit in his face, the Bible tells us. They struck him with fists. The Greek word here is kloa fizo. Kloa fizo is to hit with a clenched fist, to pulmit a person with fists. And then he rapizo. R H A P I Z O. Rapiso is to hit someone with your hand open. We translate it simply as slap. So, in the Greek language, where you just swing and with open hands. And that's what they did um, to our master. They asked him, hey, prophesy! Tell us the name of the person that just slapped you. These actions, they continued doing, seemingly enjoying every moment of it. And the Lord remained silent throughout that terrible ordeal, submitting himself to the Father's will and fulfilling Isaiah 53, verse 7, saying that he just didn't even open his mouth. He didn't even give him the satisfaction of hearing him cry out. And then we see the denial, the denial of Peter. The trial before the religious authorities, the denial of Peter in verse 69. <laughs> verse 69 says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel, young girl, came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he, Peter, denied it before them all, made sure everybody heard, no, no, saying, I don't know what you're saying. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him there and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know. Does he say his name? Oh, isn't that pitiful? I do not know that man. And after a while, a little bit more time had passed, came unto him that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for your speech bereath thee. And so he began to curse 
and swear, saying, I know, I do not know the man. And immediately the cock crewed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter had followed that mob and he gained entrance into the house of the high priest. He's moving around, okay? He sat down in the courtyard, verse 58, awaiting the outcome of the trial. He had some three, at least, great opportunities to bear witness for the Lord. No one else would stand up and give a witness. Peter says he would, if given the opportunity, even if it costs him his life. But when he was given that opportunity to bear witness, he denied it. Before we actually finish up on this, I want you to stop and think of how many times, maybe at work, maybe in a family gathering, maybe with the neighbors talking over the, or just over the fence or something like that, where you had a beautiful opportunity to give witness for the saving grace in Jesus Christ, how he transformed your life. He did, didn't he? Amen. Yes, yeah. he, he transformed your life. But that opportunity came and basically in your silence you said, I don't know the man. His first denial occurred in front of a servant girl, in front of others, that he was one who had at least been with him in Galilee. The second girl at the gate of the courtyard, more directly pointed Peter out as he had to be with Jesus of Nazareth. I just know that. And then third, finally, the number of those present and they accused Peter of being one who had been with Jesus for his Galilean accent gave him away. John gives us the specifics over in John 18, verse 25. John 18, verse 25. I'm not teaching through John so I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but um, I'd like to at least mention this because he fills out the picture so beautifully. In John 18 and verse 25, Simon Peter stood and he warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it, said I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear... Peter had cut off, saith, Did I not see thee in the garden with him? Uh oh. Aren't you the one that cut my ear off? <laughs> Busted. Cut off his, his relative's ear. Did right. you see that? Right. Yeah. His kinsman. He cut off Mal This guy is related to Malchus. He cut his ear off. Peter then denied it. Busted. And he denies it. And immediately. The cock crew. Poor Peter. He, with a third accusation. Um, when you read it in the Greek, um, it lets you know that this wasn't exactly a Baptist response that he gave back um, to those people that were accusing him. Um, he swore like a fisherman, okay? The calling curses down upon himself. That was a legal way of affirming one's innocence. If the calamities didn't follow, then he had to be innocent. Shamefully, Peter wouldn't even say the name of Jesus. As he publicly denied his Lord the third time, immediately a rooster crowed. That triggered in his thinking the words of the Lord. Before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. Verse 34. Peter knew immediately he had failed the Lord, ultimately, though he had affirmed that he would never forsake the Lord. He had publicly denied the one that he loved. Filled with remorse, he left the courtyard and was weeping bitterly. His tears were tears of true repentance for having forsaken and denied his own Lord, Jesus Christ. And then we see the dilemma of the Sanhedrin. The Dilemma of the Sanhedrin, verse 1 of, of chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away 
and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had been betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders, saying, I've sinned in that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You look after it. Let me pause there because we've heard two words that sounded very much alike, but they are quite a bit different. In the previous, we saw berayed. Your language berayed you. Your pronunciation. You've got the, the hick Galilean accent. This is like a guy from southern Georgia trying to hide his accent, okay? It isn't gonna happen, right? <laughs> because his accent berayed him. Whereas in this situation, when Judas betrayed, what is the difference between beray and betray? A W and an um, tray door. Got it? The second word, tray door. Traitor. You understand what that is? It's a person you trusted and they turned you in. They got you in trouble. They brought false accusation against you. They betrayed you. They're traitors. By the way, in both situations, we're just talking about Middle English. Be this and be that is thrown on a lot of different, different words in our English tongue. Okay, That's just kind of what the Englishman did. He but raid, um, that's like R A Y, is a light. Be raid is to put a light on something, to focus people's attention to something. Your language did not betray you. It isn't your buddy, and it's it be raid you. It put a light on your real. Um, state of origin. Do you understand? So the Averill way of remembering berayed and betrayed is tray door and ray is like a light on something that reveals something. Um, it, it is not a betrayal. In common usage now, we use betrayed in both cases. <laughs> yeah. Poorly, but we would. We would. Because berayed is actually a good you can look it up in your dictionary. Um, Google it, whatever you want. Um, it's, a, it's a functional word even today, but it was used in 1611 a little more than what we do. You're right. <laughs> we would. If I start using you read now, it would look at me funny. <laughs> or you'd have an opportunity for a teaching moment, as I have just now had. Okay. And he said, verse 4, saying I've sinned that I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and he departed. He went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, here's the Sanhedrin's dilemma. What do we do with this? Why? Well, it's not lawful for us to put them in the treasury. This is blood money. This is a price of blood. So they took counsel. Interesting that they can take from the treasury and give blood money, but they can't take blood money and put it in the treasury. Nice guys. Huh. Bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore the field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, and whom they of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. 
Jesus' first G Jewish trials had occurred under the cover of darkness. Since Jewish law required trials to be conducted in broad daylight hours, the chief priests and the elders and the people realized that the official daylight trial was necessary. So they reconvened. The brief trial recorded in chapter 27 and verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, one verse full, um, was simply for the court to reaffirm what had taken place earlier. It justified that particular um, sentence. The court decided that Jesus must die. But they didn't want to put that decision into action. To get a death sentence, they'd rather take the case to Pontius Pilate, the governor, the procreator of Judah and Samaria. He was procreator, Rome's representative, from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. Ten years. You say, ten years? That's not very long. Ah, that's a record in that part of the world, of the Roman Empire. Jesus was therefore bound and he was brought, to the Jew, brought by the Jews to Pilate. Pilate's official residence was at Caesarea, but during the festival time, he was at his Jerusalem palace. When Judas Iscariot realized the outcome of the deliberations, the King James Bible says, he repented himself repent. Think that one over a second time. Most of the modern translations, if you're using a modern translation, they usually use the word <coughs> remorse. Remorse is a, is a gnawing distress arising from the sense of guilt for past wrongs. Re is back again. Mordere is to bite. But that's not what the original Greek. He didn't get a bite and say, oh, I wished I wouldn't have done that. He didn't rethink and say, oh, that was sin. I shouldn't have done that. He neither repented nor had he any remorse. The Greek says, meta melistes. Meta is afterwards and melo is to be concerned. Do you see what the Greek is actually saying about Judas? Afterwards, he gets concerned. Oh, this isn't turning out like I thought it was going to turn out. Better understood, Averill translation, um, would be he had second thoughts. There doesn't seem to be any repentance or genuine remorse anywhere inside that man Judas. Things just didn't turn out the way that he thought it was supposed to turn out. He had not envisioned this when he betrayed Jesus, but what he had hoped to accomplish isn't mentioned in the biblical text. What was he looking for? I'm sorry? A physical kingdom, and Jesus wasn't producing it? Maybe if I press him, get him arrested, he'll stand up and lightning will shine from him. Judas saw his miracles. Judas did his miracles. Remember when Jesus sends G his disciples out to do the miracles, the healing? Judas was one of those men who put his hand on a person that was terribly sick and saw that person immediately healed. Judas knew the power of Messiah Jesus. Well, maybe if I just say to these guys, I'll, I'll turn him in, they'll, they'll capture him, and then he'll, like Hercules, you know, chains go flying, and he's, and he's, dancing. Hey, Greg, can I ask you a question? Sure. You're mm -hmm. saying that, uh, you know, Peter, he didn't repent, but in verse 3 it says, or I'm just talking about Judas. Judas did, did not repent. repent. But in verse 3 it says, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented. Yes, that is the King James Version, yeah. and I told you what the Greek word is. Okay. The Greek word here is to be bit again. It is not 
repent. Repent is to feel sorry for something and so rethink it. Repent. Okay. Penance comes from that. And the modern translations, if you were looking at a modern, they use remorse. And it wasn't remorse either. The Bible tells us that he had second thoughts on this because it just didn't turn out like Judas wanted it to turn out. And what I'm saying right now is the Bible doesn't really reveal how did he want that to be. Yes, Satan entered him while he was still in the presence of the other disciples. And Jesus said, go do what you need to do. If there is no remorse, why would he take his own life? Uh -huh. Aha. Yes. Um, I just blew it. I did the wrong thing. Take this money back. We can't do that. Take it back. And then he goes out and strings himself up. That is not repentance. Repentance would have had the picture that Judas then went down on his knees and he said, Father, forgive me, a sinner. Please change. Repentance. A change of heart. The man Judas never changed. A hardened man committed suicide. Um, where did I leave off? Okay. The religious leaders were unsympathetic, pointing out that it was his problem, not theirs. So Jesus, uh, Judas did, um, decided he couldn't keep that money that he had re received for betraying the Lord. Hey, but curiously, he didn't have any similar guilt about keeping the disciples' money. Right. He pockets the disciples' money at this particular point in history, but he feels guilty about holding on to the 30 piece, that blood money. He went to the temple and he threw, the Bible tells us, it doesn't say money, threw the silver into the temple. It uses the word naos, which is the holy place itself. Um, unlike Peter, however, Judas's remorse did not include any repentance for he went from the temple and he hanged himself. And this is a word not like hanging up your hat on a nail, okay? This Greek word for hanging is apachomai, which means to strangle, to choke until death ensues. He hung himself, he choked himself um, to death by a rope. Judas's act of throwing the betrayal money into the temple caused the religious leaders some problems. They didn't feel the money should be put into the temple coffers since it was blood money, but the money was paid as pretty good, substantial, so they decided to take the money and to buy a parcel of land, apparently in Judas's name, Acts chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 gives you that. And it gives you more information in regards to what happened to Judas, by the way. Um, and they bought this land to bury foreigners. Um, it, it uses the happy Greek word xenioi, um, which is the plural uh, a zen... You were going to tell me that wasn't right, weren't you? Okay. Zenoi, like Illinois, got it? Um, and xenophobic? Um, we use that word zeno um, in our language as well for a foreigner, someone outside um, our people uh, group. And they bought it for the pot makers. The land that the pot makers used to get clay, they bought it and they started using it as a cemetery for Zenoi, the foreigners that would die in Jerusalem. And it was given the Aramaic name Akel Dama. Akel is a field. Dam, D-A-M, is blood. 
Um, Akel Dama, the field of blood. Adam, that's where he got his name because he had blood. Okay? Adam is red. Um, well, I diverse. Matthew viewed these events in the fulfillment of prophecy of Jeremiah. But the prophecy Matthew quoted is primarily from Zechariah, if you look at your side notes. It's not from Jeremiah, primarily. There's close correlation between these verses and Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Zechariah 11, 12 and 13. But there are also some similarities between Matthew's words and the idea that's found in Jeremiah chapter 19, verses 1, 4, 6, 11. As you go through that section, you'll see the talk of the potter's field and, the, and buying that. <coughs> Why then did Matthew refer to it only as Jeremiah's? Well, the solution to this problem is probably that Matthew had both prophets in mind. He was thinking of Zechariah, and he was thinking of Jeremiah, and in there they were both talking about this, and so he refers to the major prophet rather than the minor prophet. Similar situation found in Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, where Mark mentions the prophet Isaiah when he's translating, or excuse me, he's quoting from um, both Isaiah and Malachi. And then, fourth and finally, the trial before the civil authorities. Verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Now that's a different Greek word that is used in reference when he said that to the high priest and when he uses it to uh, Pilate. This is much more polite, okay, <laughs> what he says to the Roman procreator. It's your words and it's right. He affirms it without a question. Are you the king of the Jews? Just as you have said would be a good translation of that. And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered, not a thing. Then said Pilate unto him, hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And Jesus answered him, never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. He was, good translation would be amazed. He's sitting back, can't believe what he's listening to. Now, at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye, y'all, that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Messiah? He knew that it was by envy that they'd even delivered him. And when he sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent him uh, a note, sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just, that innocent? The actual word that's used there in the Greek is righteous. That righteous man, for I have suffered many things because of him. Compared with the other Gospels, Matthew's record of Jesus' trial before Pilate is really rather brief. Luke even mentioned that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod and then learned that Jesus was a Gal when he learned that Jesus was a Galilean in Luke 23. That gesture brought about a new friendship between Pilate and Herod. Matthew also mentioned one, only one trial before Pilate, though you see there was actually two. And the one accusation, what was the accusation? Jesus claims to be the king of the Jews. The king, uh, kingship of Jesus, of course, was Matthew's main theme. When Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? The answer came in the affirmative. But John records Jesus' kingdom at that time was not a political kingdom. Anything that would rival Rome, 
John chapter 18. Jesus was no threat to Rome. Pilate realized that completely. And so Pilate wanted to release this righteous, this innocent man. While other accusations were presented by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus didn't answer them. Pilate was amazed. Legally, Jesus didn't have to address those charges. Why? He was not being tried for those accusations. He was being tried for claiming that he is the king of the Jews. Rome would not crucify a man for blasphemy against a Hebrew God. Got it? Instead, he was on trial because they had claimed that he said he was king of the Jews. He was Messiah. Furthermore, Pilate had declared Jesus' innocence. There was no reason for him to answer anything. Um, Verses 15 through 23, we see Pilate had been warned by his wife, be careful how he dealt with this prisoner, for he is dikaios, D-I-K-A-I-O-S, dikaios, that is righteous. She'd suffered a great deal through a dream concerning Jesus. She shared that with her husband, tread lightly. To speculate beyond the words of the text, uh, to understand what her dream was about would be useless, because she doesn't say. Since Pilate believed Jesus was innocent, he tried to have him released. It was a custom of the governor to release a prisoner each year at Passover to gain acceptance from the Jews. His plan was to bring about the release of Jesus. And his plan involved a notorious prisoner by the name of Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist, John 18, who was a murderer, Mark chapter 15. Pilate thought that surely the people of this nation would honor Jesus, their Messiah, that only the leaders were envious of him and the people acclaim of him. So he reasoned that if the people had a choice, come on, they're going to release Jesus and they're going to nail Barabbas to the cross. When Pilate asked the crowd what he should do with Jesus, they answered back, crucify him. The Greek text chose their cry as one word, um, starothito, starothito, given in the third person, singular, eris, imperative, kill him, crucify him. Um, the word starothitos means to skewer him. You can almost picture the scene. It's like in a football stadium in which the crowd starts yelling, one more down, one more down, one more down. It's a chant. The chant that was going on here is, crucify, crucify. When Potts, Pilate sought further information from the crowd, what was his crimes? They just started yelling the louder, crucify. She ye talev. And I put it up here. This is the word that they, they were shouting. She ye tsa lev. Se ye tsa lev. Se ye tsa lev. It's a, it's a chant. Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate's record with Caesar was really not good. Oh, I wish I had time. Um, Pilate did a lot of bad things. The Jews got upset that he changed the military capital to Jerusalem from Caesarea, which meant that all the armor and the, and the uh, si- signs and signals uh, went to Fort Antonia, which overlooked the temple. They were furious. Huge delegation went to Caesarea to his palace. Five days they chanted outside his, his palace saying, stop it. And so he said, okay. So he said, y'all go over to the amphitheater and I'll share with you basically how we're going to fix this. And so they did. And then he put a battalion of troops around them with spears. And they said, go ahead. We will accept your spears. Now that's a joke. You missed it. 
because you didn't realize that in Latin, the word pilot means one who bears or carries a spear. They said, you're carrying a spear? We'll take it. He buckled under and he moved the things back. But there were several others that I could share with you in which a lot of people were slaughtered by Pilate. So Pilate is really on, on uh, eggshells right now. So he took water and he washed his hand in front of the crowd, symbolizing that he is innocent of this man's death. But his words, I am innocent of this man's blood, didn't make him innocent of the blood of Jesus. Such an act did not remove Pilate's guilt in this mockery of justice. In closing, when Pilate turned the responsibility over to the Jews in verse 24, they readily accepted and said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Their words became a prophecy and came to pass in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the nation and torched the temple. In spite of Pilate's four declarations, Luke chapter 23, verse 14, verse 20, verse 22, and in John chapter 19, verse 4, where he said, he is innocent, I can release him. He never did release Jesus, but he released Barabbas, and he turned Jesus over for crucifixion and flogging. We'll look at that next week. Father, it breaks our heart to think of what your son went through because of my sin, the sin of my family, the sin of our people. Father, we recognize that we are to blame. We should have taken that beating, that slapping around and punching around. But he took it for us. Thank you for the love that's beyond all love. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on Calvary that we could have eternal life, who rose from the grave that third day to offer it to us as a free gift. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.